Welcome to episode number 301 of Category 5 Technology TV. It is Tuesday, the 25th of June, 2013. I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Rachel Hsu. Hey, Rachel. All right. So coming up in the news on this show, we have some very exciting stuff. I clicked a button and broke the computer. Already. It doesn't take long. <laughs> it doesn't take long. This fancy little mouse here with all the buttons. All right. Close the curtains, plug in your precision pointer mouse, and axe your social life. Portal is now officially available for Linux. Ooh. Wow. And South Korean government websites came under cyber attack this morning. Munich, Germany is encouraging its citizens to switch from Windows XP to Linux. And Neat. a Facebook exploit has revealed the personal contact info of around 6 million users. But Facebook acts like it's not a big deal. And webcam hackers may be watching you. Dun, dun, dun. Whoa. So stick around. These stories are coming up later in the show. Are they watching us? Yikes. Hi. Hey, everybody. Tonight, we've got an exceptional show for you. We are going to learn to install the latest version. Yes, the latest version of Adobe Air on our Linux machine. Ooh. <laughs> Why would we want to do that? Find out tonight. Also, we're going to be showing you how to track your time so that you can get paid for all of the work that you do when you're working on a cool project. Uh, it happens to the best of us. You're working away, and you don't record all your time, and you end up losing some money. So stick around. We're going to show you how to do all that coming up on the show tonight right here on Category 5 TV. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. This is Category 5 Technology TV. At EcoAlkalines, we believe you should be able to trust your batteries not just here, but here, here, and here. But with one exception, you should also be able to trust your batteries here. EcoAlkalines are the world's first and only certified carbon neutral battery manufactured to the highest standards of recycling and quality, without any trace amounts of harmful chemicals like mercury, lead, or cadmium. EcoAlkalines provide performance that rivals leading national alkaline battery brands at a comparable price. Find out more about the EcoAlkalines difference. EcoAlkalines.com this is Category 5 Technology TV, and you'll find us online at www.category5.tv. Hey, I want to say big thanks to um, our monthly donors as well as our one-time donations that have come in over the past couple of months. Um, this month, we actually hit a snag. Uh, episode 300 went to air last week, and we ran out. We actually literally ran out of space on our server. Uh, it's a storage server. We put you know every episode of Category 5 on there, and it fills up real fast, and, and we actually ran out of space. So I was able, with your donations, I was able to go out and, and upgrade that server. We got an extra 600 and some odd gigabytes, which gives us, to us, it translates into about another year's worth of broadcasting being able to be stored there. So just wanted to personally extend a thanks to those who have donated. Um, if you'd like to donate to help the show, you can go to cat5.tv slash C, and what I started doing, Rachel, is I thought it would be a good idea for you know people want to know how the donations are being spent so i actually i've started listing there um starting with the the upgrade to the to the uh, file server kind of wh where the money goes and and what we spend it on so not to you sorry <laughs> donations just so you know okay so what pays for the show what pays for our, our regular expenses and and keeping the show going keeping it strong is advertising so all the ads that you see please click on them visit websites of sponsors and things like that that's what pays for the show to happen then when you donate the funds that are given to us by our viewers those are used to expand so that's where we are able to upgrade cameras get better lighting uh, and of course we're working on building studio d which is our brand new studio uh, we're going to be moving the uh, the studio out of the basement and into its own space and that's always been the plan since my wife and I first bought our house back in September so we're really excited about that so that's what we're raising funds for right now um, so if you care to donate if you're able to cat5.tv slash c with big thanks and again, I'll post what, what we spend that on. So, uh, Big news for our RSS subscribers. The RSS feeds are almost synced over to the brand new servers, so we're excited about that. It's going to be a lot faster for you as well. It means that people who are watching in mainland China are going to be able to watch 
just any of the feeds that they want. They don't have to use alternate feeds or anything Ni like hao. that. So if you're watching from a place where you cannot access our regular feeds, that is all going to change within the ne- next little while. Check out our mobile site, m.cat5.tv. People in the chat room are saying, you know, how can we watch the show on our mobile device? Well, here you, here you go. You can actually go over there, scan that code, go to m.cat5.tv. You can watch live. You can listen live. And, of course, you can watch the on-demand videos as well. Uh, so after the show, you can catch the, the on-demand. Pretty cool. That's my spiel for the intro of the show. Your and turn, that's right? that's it. Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I got nothing for you. Well, well it's no, the beginning of the next hundred episodes. I know. And wow. I thought he started it off right with, you know, the best co-host. Got to like start that. it well. She's biased. Know? She's pretty excellent. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, it was pretty amazing celebrating our 300th episode last week with Carrie Webb. That was uh, quite an honor to have her here. And I, I appreciate all the emails and comments people saying you how... You looked like such a little baby in the I first know. episode. I was like a hundred pounds che- smaller and <laughs> I had longer hair. And <laughs> yeah, grown that back. So that's kind of... There you go. Still wore the cardigans. Though. Still wore the cardigans. It's all part of the theme. Yeah. Keep those emails coming, folks. I'll forward them along to Carrie as well. Lots of comments in the chat room. Thank you very much. Cool. There's that's your name, right there. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Category Five TV <laughs> is a member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here, and the International Association of Internet Broadcasters. Why, oh why, would we want to install Adobe Air on our beautiful, modern, sleek, cutting-edge Linux machine? or Windows machine for that matter, or any machine. Fact is, there are some apps out there that really, you know, you've got to have Adobe Air to run them. It's as simple as it is, but we're not giving Adobe a lot of love these days because Adobe has not given us a lot of love. And and to cancel, to outright blatantly cancel support for Adobe Air on Linux makes you go, well, fine, I'm not going to install it. But then you find a beautiful app like the one we're going to look at tonight, And it requires Adobe Air. So then you go back to the get.adobe.com and you say, okay, fine, I'll install it. And then you realize, oh, there's no longer any support for it. The version is about 3,000 times uh, old and it's no longer any good. Can't be installed on Debian 7. Doesn't work. So what do you do? Well, you fall back on the good old wine application which allows us to install Windows programs on our Linux machine. So I'm actually going to go over to getadobe.com. Let's go there together tonight. Get.adobe.com slash air. And this is going to give us what? Adobe Air. Well, here's what us Linux users are talking about. Adobe Air for Linux is no longer supported. That's so nice of you, Adobe. So what are we going to do? We're going to pretend that we're on a different operating system. So we click on that and we say, hey, we're on Windows. Sure we are. And then we're going to choose the latest and greatest version of Adobe Air, version 3.7. Download now. Do we want to open it or do we want to save it? We're just going to simply save it. Save it to our computer. While that's downloading, which it's already done, I'm just going to go into my terminal. And here's what you need to do to get the ability in Linux to install Windows applications. We're going to go sudo apt-get install wine, just like that. Let that run. You'll see in my particular case, wine is already the newest version. I already have this installed, so I'm golden. I don't need it, so that's fine. What I'm going to do, I'm going to go to my downloads folder. Here you go, and you'll see that now that I've downloaded the Adobe Air installer, it's there. So I want to show you something because this is where sometimes we can get hung up because sometimes things don't quite work the way that you would expect. And here, Adobe Air is not going to be any exception because we're not running Windows. It's a Windows installer. We're actually running Linux. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to double click on it now that I've got Wine. Or I can right click on it and go Open with Wine or whatever. And you'll see something interesting here. Adobe Air. This application requires a version of Adobe Air which cannot be found. So, yeah. (laughs) 
Which came first, right? <laughs> the chicken or the egg? Chicken or the egg scenario here, folks. <gasps> that moment when you don't think you're on camera. You're That's there like, oh. when the guy who operates the camera purposefully puts you there. <sighs> What do you do? Okay, Adobe Air requires Adobe Air to install. That's crazy talk. So how do you get past this? It's actually surprisingly simple. What we're going to do is we're going to go back to our terminal here. Notice I'm using terminal. We can use Synaptic Package Manager or your favorite package manager. But I'm doing this because I want you to be familiar enough with this that it's not an intimidating thing to use the terminal. Pseudo apt get install. And here's something interesting that we're going to need libwine cms. L I B W I N E cms. Interestingly, it's, it's, I believe, like some kind of a color scheming kind of deal, but it includes the stuff that's required by Adobe Air in order to install. So now that I've installed that, see it's in. Wine has grabbed that. Now I'm going to, again, double click on Adobe Air installer. And let's see what happens. There we go. That's more familiar. I agree. Adobe Air has been successfully installed. So now we're going to finish. And now let's see if it actually got installed. We're going to go into our slash home slash Robbie slash dot wine. I don't think it's actually put it here. I think it's probably put it into our root folder. But let's find out. I'm going to go into drive C. And you know where we're going to find it is Program Files, Common Files. You'd think that it would be under Adobe, but it's not. It's going to be under Common Files. There it is, Adobe Air Versions 1.0. And there it is, the Adobe Air Application Installer. Not sure if Wine actually puts a, a link to it on our, on our menu or not. Doesn't look like it. But we can create one easily enough. So you see how I got there? And I'm going to post links for this. Uh, or information for this textually in the show notes for episode number 301 so that you can follow along. But now that that's installed, see I can go to my home folder slash dot wine. Notice that it has a dot before it because it's a hidden folder. You're not actually going to see it when you're looking at the Robbie folder. So you actually have to hit control L and then type in dot wine and then go into your drive C, program files, common files, Adobe Air versions 1.0. And you'll see that Adobe Air application installer. So now if I double click on that, all goes well. There it is, and it's asking me for my, uh, my installer package. There it is. So that's all there is to it. Adobe Air is installed on our Linux. This is Debian 7. This is actually uh, Point Linux. Okay. So now we've got the brand new latest version 3.7 of Adobe Air. Ooh. If you're a Windows user, that whole scenario is pointless to you. You can just download the installer and run it. On Linux, though, now, is it a Linux problem? No. Okay, i got to reiterate that this is not... It's not so complicated because Linux made it so. No, it's because Adobe has said, we're not going to support Linux anymore. And that was their choice, and it was a one that... So you we found can, a way to get around We can it. work around it. Mm -hmm. Okay, folks, so now here we've got Adobe Air running on our Linux machine without needing a virtual machine or anything like that. So now that we've got Adobe Air, we can install Adobe Air packages. Okay, so whether you are on Linux, now we've got the ability to run Adobe Air pro programs, or if you're on Windows or you're on Mac, as long as you've got Adobe Air installed from get.adobe.com, you'll be able to run any of these programs, right? So we're going to take a look at one tonight. Now that we've got that, okay, we're going to go to... I'm just going to zoom in here a little bit. Get clock, K-L-O-K dot com. It's spelt K-L-O-K dot com. Again, links are going to be in the show notes for episode number 301. What we're looking at tonight is the ability to actually keep track of our time. Have you ever, oh, I, I, just a kind of a rhetorical question, but you can answer if you like, Rachel. Have you ever been working on a project? You're doing something for a customer uh, whatever it may be, you can probably think of an example. M for me, it's websites. And I'll sit down and I'll be working, 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 and then I realize, oh, I haven't been keeping track of my time here. How long did I spend? Oh, I think it was about an hour. Not too sure. Or worst case scenario, you, you've finished a project and you realize I have not been meticulous with my time tracking and I know I've spent more time than this. Here I've got a bill that, you know, based on the time that I have tracked is 500 bucks. I know that I've spent twice that time. 
I should be getting a thousand bucks, but I can't account for that time. Well, kind this actually this happened to me at one of my jobs. Like yeah. I could account for my time. I just always keep a record of how many hours I do on my calendar. And when I got my paycheck, it was actually seven and a half hours off. So then I went. Oh really? I went back and said, "You owe me seven and a half hours still." Hmm. So if I hadn't looked over my hours, I would have missed out and given them a free day's work. So you're just marking on a physical like I, m- monthly calendar. Yeah, I just had a calendar and a pen. I would write okay. my hours. On. Okay, so what I want to look at tonight is the ability to actually track meticulously, not just the time that you're spending, but also the uh, the actual work that you're doing during that time so that I can look back and I can actually see everything that was done, how much time was spent doing it, generate reports, take it to billing and actually invoice based on those reports, be able to create timesheets. Uh, based on whichever project I'm doing, uh, being able to track multiple projects and generate timesheets for each project so that I can build them accurately. The other scenario for me is is that quite often I end up providing telephone support. So, you know, the phone rings, I stop what I'm doing, I pick up the phone and I start talking to a customer and I might spend 45 minutes on the phone walking them through something or I might even remote into their computer with TeamViewer or something like that and fix the problem for them and then never actually bill for that time. And that was a big, I I think Carrie touched on it last week, that that became a really, really big problem for me in business because it's really hard to be meticulous with that type of time. Really hard to keep track of. And it's really tough to also make sure that you punch off the clock for one project and then start tracking for another project if the phone rings or there's some kind of interruption or something like that. So with this software that we're going to look at tonight, which is called Clock, simply K-L-O-K, it's Clock 2, we're actually going to be able to do exactly what I'm explaining here. And we're going to be able to track meticulously every little bit of detail with regards to our projects. So there is a free version of Clock. If you go to Get clock.com and again for those of you who are listening and not watching uh, it is klok.com and links will be in the show notes for episode number 301 scroll down a little ways and you'll see get started with the free version you'll also see that the commercial version is only $20 I'm going to suggest that you actually buy the commercial version uh, but for tonight we're actually going to download the free version just to show you how it works now what's different about the commercial version versus the free version. So the commercial version, you can see right on their website, there is a lot that comes with the professional edition for only 20 bucks. You get things like synchronization with your mobile devices, the ability to uh, use uh, an enhanced dashboard view, MS Exchange export, if that, or import, I should say, if that matters to you. Uh, most important thoughts are the things that I think are most important is the ability to integrate your Google Calendar, customize your timesheet layouts, uh, automate your own backups of the software, as well as you receive priority support. And that's only for 20 bucks. So it's worth it if you, but you grab the free version tonight just to try it. So I'm going to download now. And you'll see that, oh, it's actually associated with the Adobe Air application installer. That's cool. Um, that was installed with Wine, but just to be safe, I'm actually going to save this file because I want to. I want to show you how I would normally do this. So I've saved that. Now you'll see that the file exists in my downloads folder. Okay, clock to dot air. So now back in my Air 1.0 folder, which we looked at a little bit earlier tonight, I'm going to double click on the Adobe Air application installer, and I'm going to simply browse to slash home slash Robbie slash downloads and you'll see that clock2.air is now there. So I'm going to click on that and go open and you'll see that Adobe Air is going to open up with the Adobe Air installer and we can go install. Do we want a shortcut on our desktop? Do we want to start the application after install? Sure. Default location is on our pro- in our program files uh, on the virtual C drive of Wine. So we're going to continue and that's all there is to it. Done installed. We'll accept the agreement and now we are into the trial version of Clock. Continue using the free version and now maximize that to our screen. We can see exactly how that works. Now what I'm actually going to do, I want to show you the, I I would love to show you the commercial version so I'm just going to punch in my key here that I have for the software. See if I can get in.
And wouldn't you know, I'm actually having some trouble with the interface on uh. Adobe Air and wine. <laughs> oh! Maybe you drank too much wine before trying it. Yeah, out. yeah. <laughs> None of that. Okay, let's give it a try here. Clock 2, which is added to my, my menu. Give it a try. Okay, now it's now it's good. That was kind of weird. It was like my my mouse kind of lost access to Ooh, to the interface for some Twilight reason. Twilight Zone. Yeah, it might be because I'm using Synergy. I don't know. So we'll just pretend. You edit that out with your brain. All right. <laughs> so under Tools Preferences, now I can enter my license key here. So I'm going to do that without the. That's what I wanted to do without you actually seeing my license key here. So just going to quickly enter that. What? What? You looking at the top of my head? <laughs> Making fun of me? Why did you guys use such long <laughs> keys here, folks? Okay. Now I'm going to activate. It's activating. And it is active. There we go. So now I've got a full version of clock. Okay, so under tools, preferences. Now I'm skipping over the general tab because of the fact that it does reveal in plain text my license code. You can change your data file location so you can store it on a network drive, something like that, which is actually what I do. I use, uh, I'm using a Samba mount through CIFS. I've got a mount on a network NAS device and I'm storing my data files there so that if I ever have a computer crash, it's okay because it's on a redundant storage device that gets backed up every night. Okay, so formatting. Here we go. We've got our 12 hour, 24 hour mode. We've got the date layouts and things like that. How many projects do you want to remember? I would just set that to something high myself. Snapping, I would leave off. That's for your calendar. Appearance, what do you want it to look like? Do you want it to look like the night look that it has right now or do you want it to be uh, blue instead? You can do whatever you like. Those are included with the application. Software updates, you can check automatically. Plugins. With the Pro version, you can actually add plugins and connectors and things like that. And you can also uh, export your timesheets and change your timesheet layout, which is really, really cool. You can generate your own output from the software so that it can conform to your, your process and the way that you do things. Your backups, again, this is the professional edition, so you can actually set it up to automatically back up every X number of days. And you can tell it where you would like to store the backups as well, which, again, I would recommend we put those on some kind of outside drive, put it on a Samba share or an SSH drive or something that's outside of the current, you know, your existing computer. Okay. From there, do you want it to start when the user logs in? Handy if you're going to have a dedicated time tracking computer, uh, which I actually do. Interestingly enough, the way that I do it is that I have, I, I've got a little 14 inch monitor and I've got several monitors on my desk, but I just happen to have a little 14 inch monitor that is absolutely useless for anything because it's so small perfect for time tracking. So I've got that off to the side and I've got an old, old computer running there, just something that we found in the back and that is running clock 24-7 at my desk. Then I use Synergy to be able to use my mouse back and forth between the two systems. So that is, you know, for me, startup options start when the user logs in is pretty handy and then I've got my computer automatically log in and it's brilliant. Okay. So now that we are done setting up our software, you notice that there's no save button or anything like that. I'm going to click on week view up at the top. And you see, because I was clicking randomly, I've actually created a bunch of empty projects here. I'm just going to delete those. All right. I'm sometimes having a little bit of interface trouble. I don't think that that's a clock issue because I uh, haven't had that issue before. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to add, by clicking this Add button up here, I'm going to actually add a, uh, a project. So now you see I've got a few here, but new project at the bottom here. So what we're doing now is we're actually creating our first project that we're going to track. So Rachel, what kind of work would you be tracking? Would you be, like, what, what would you do that you might want to track this meticulously? Um, painting. I do murals and stuff. So. Okay. So let's say, so if you were going to paint me a mural, so let's say this project could Down be Down to the second. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fill me by the hour. Okay. Um, let's say um, Robbie's 
studio mural. Let's just say that that's what you wanted to call it. And then you could say, okay, it's billable. This is important, whether it's billable or not, because it's actually going to give you approximations as to what you're owed, which is very, very handy. And then based on the hourly rate of, what do you charge, maybe $600 an hour? Uh, let's say it's 60 bucks an hour, just for kicks, okay? Of course, I'm your favorite, so you would check that off. The other thing that you, uh, that you can do here is you can go to properties and you can change the color. And the reason that you would do that is so that each individual um, item or each individual project has its own color uh, within your, your time clock. You can estimate how much time this is going to take so that if you think that it's going to be about 100 hours, it's going to let you know if you're approaching that or that kind of thing. Contact name, contact email, contact phone number. All that stuff can be stored here as well. Everything else is currently empty because I haven't actually done any work here. Okay, so now back in my week view. Again, nothing is there yet. So now I can actually right click on that and I can go add a sub project. So now as a part of Robbie's mural, Robbie's studio mural, we're going to create a new sub project. We're going to call this priming. And we're going to create that sub project. So now we've got Robbie's studio mural priming. What else would you do for a painting? Add another sub project to that. Uh, would we say design or mock up? Maybe you would call it sketching it out kind of thing. Yeah. Design. And then the actual painting. Painting, clean up. Right. Going to the store and getting materials. Yeah. So notice we're kind of planning this out. Yeah, going to the store as well. So all those things could be accounted for. Um, so we could call this extra. Um, store visits, clean up, etc. Stuff that you may not charge for, but you want to still keep track of separately. Okay. So now, okay, so now it's time to start priming. So I can actually highlight priming. Notice that we've actually kind of planned this out. So we know that these are a few of the different things. But at any time throughout the course of the project, if you start doing something else, you can then create another sub project. And you can do that at any time. You don't have to do that at the beginning. So we're going to start priming. I'm going to press start. And you'll see in my calendar now. So we are actually Tuesday, June 25th. And it is approximately, what time is it? Probably about 7.27. So there we are. So just before 7.30, you see that it's there. So now we've got this little time thing here. You can see that it's actually working its way into the calendar. Up at the top, it tells me, reminds me what it is that I'm working on right now. So I'm working on priming. So now what I want to do is I can either click here to add a comment to this, okay, or at anywhere in the calendar, once you've got entries in here, I can actually just point to it and you see a add a comment to this entry right there. So I can add a comment and we can say um, initial priming of the wall. There we go. And then save. And so all this stuff is happening instantly. So if I go project view and go to the time entries, you can see that that time entry is already here uh, and it's already tracking. It's only five minutes so far, and it's it's going up from there. Um, and as you go, obviously, it's going to be tracking everything that you do. So if you miss something, let's stop that project. So I click on the stop button here. I can actually add something to the uh, to the the timeline here that I maybe I missed, and I can set the start time, the end time, the date, and the comment. So you know I can move that around if I happen to miss it and I can say okay here we go update that save it and now if you look at your dashboard you're gonna start to see something interesting you're seeing some graphs you're seeing uh, now we only have Robbie studio mural as a, a current project if you had more than one project of course you're gonna see some really awesome graphs you get some bar graphs and some charts um, you, you see the pie chart there as well so that you can see how you're utilizing your time and I actually keep track of everything from the client work that I'm doing to my lunch breaks to whatever else so that I can get a really good look at, at what it is that I'm doing throughout the day and what's billable and what's not. And what's cool too, because I, I add projects that are not billable, so my lunches and, and things that I'm like internal work, if I'm working on our own website, things like that. So then I can actually generate reports. You'll see that Clock will allow me to generate a an overview of billable as well as non-billable. So if something is non-billable, I can actually see on a graph 
that I'm spending too much time doing non-billable stuff and I should be doing more billable stuff so that I, I can equal that out. And it helps me personally so that I can, I can kind of, I try to keep a, a fair, um, I guess like a, a fair amount of paid work versus the amount of internal work that I'm doing. If I'm doing invoicing or quoting, I want to do an equivalent amount of billable work kind of thing. I'm just imagining your chart. It's like five it's hours of eating a sandwich. Nothing like that. No, <laughs> no, it's nothing like that. But uh, throughout the day, you know, my calendar looks fairly full. Uh, because I'm tracking meticulously every single project that I've got. So on my left-hand column, and you can do this too with Clock, is you can add every little project that you're working on here. So for my lunch break, I might add, and that's just a silly little thing, but I like to keep track of everything, and I'm going to put lunch, and is it billable? No. And then I'm going to go there, and I can say, okay, now I'm going to start lunch. And now I'm on lunch, and it'll tell me, when my lunch break is up because I'm actually seeing a little timer there that tells me that I'm at five minutes and when I'm at 30 or an hour or whatever, I know, hey, time to end my lunch, right? So that's just a, a really quick dive into clock and, and how we can time track using this amazing software. And then we can generate all these timesheets and reports. I mean, fantastic that we can go and we can you know generate these timesheets. As I showed you a little bit earlier, uh, you can you can create basically your own template, how you want it to look, how you want it to output, and everything is output there. And then you can export it to an Excel spreadsheet, which is handy for me. I send it out to the billing department, and then they put together all the orders and everything like that. Um, so fantastic piece of software. I talked to them, and I said, what's with Adobe Air, and are you sticking with that? And they did mention that they are working on a, an HTML5 version of Clock, but it's a, it's a long ways off. Uh, but there is that in the plan. So it's not something that's going to die off with Adobe Air. It's something that they are actively developing and working on, and it is growing and getting better and better all the time. Uh, so you don't have to worry about that. Check it out. It is, again, it's only $20 for the full professional edition. It is getclock, spelled K-L-O-K dot com. Check it out today. Get the free version and get yourself into it just to figure out if, hey, the, maybe this is a great solution for you. And for me, it really is about keeping track of my time so that I can get paid for the time that I'm spending. So that every time I get interrupted, I'm clocking that and I'm able to keep track and I'm able to bill for that time. So, And it works. I mean, I'm on Debian 7 here, Point Linux, and it works great. Works fantastically well. And, you know, the, the problem is, is you, you, once you're transitioned onto Debian 7 now, if you're not using GNOME 3, Hamster App is gone. Hamster app is gone in general because it was a GNOME 2 app, so you lose the ability to track with that. Here's an excellent alternative for Linux, Mac, or Windows. So, enjoy. 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 <laughs> this is Category stuff. 5 Technology TV. Our website is down there, category5.tv. I'm Robbie Ferguson. I'm Rachel Shu. Rachel, what you got? Alrighty, so it's time for some news. I know you're all so excited about this. You make it sound so exciting, Yay! Rachel. Wow. As Tom Swaminski comments, um, well, so many, so much for getting any work done this summer. The revered platform shooter game Portal has been in a Linux beta since early May, but starting today, Portal for Linux is stable and available to buy by all. Yes. Um, if you already own a copy of Portal for Windows, you'll be able to find a Linux version um, already available for download in your Steam for Linux library. Anyone That's else? Awesome. Anyone else wanting in on the fun can buy Portal for just ten dollars. Nice. So, have you tried it? Is it? I like haven't yet. Unreal this is tournament. Just like, this is like today. It's got to be. M no, more, I mean. I mean, it's have you gameplay? played Portal on no. another? Anything? No. But I know about it, it and looks I think it's unreal tournament esque. You, well, Portal has like you shoot. Don't you create portals and and then you can travel from one position to the other kind of thing, with the same velocity, same momentums, all that kind of stuff. I've never. I have no clue. Do you remember we actually started developing a game, and this kind of reminds. <laughs> do you remember it? Oh, the cheese! Yes. The cheese teleport. You can actually find it on YouTube. You they stole our idea. It seems kind of like that. Teleport was our game that we started in the... When did we do that? We started developing this back... That was like 
seven years ago. Some. And when was Portal made? Yeah, I, there's got to be. Wait a minute. There's got to be a. <laughs> patent I want that we, my money. Yeah, so ten dollars you're selling this thing for, hey? No, we actually started developing a game, and this kind of reminds me of it. But that's so cool. This kind of reminds you of it with it way bigger does. budget and skills yeah. and Our, <laughs> everything. Ours didn't ever quite get that far. No. It was playable, but not. we didn't get to building the worlds and all that quite yet. <laughs> we had it on paper. <laughs> it anyway. was pretty comical. All right. Yeah, yeah. So South Korea has issued That's a awesome. cyber alert for an apparent coordinated hacking attack on government websites this morning. The incident came on the anniversary of the start of the Korean War, which divided the Korean Peninsula. Referring to the presidential office, the science ministry gave a statement this morning saying, the government can confirm a cyber attack by unidentified hackers that shut down several sites, including the Blue House. The website for the Office for Government Policy Coordination and some media servers was also said to be affected by the attack. Hmm. Hmm. Scary stuff. All right, and also we have thousands of free Linux cities are to be distributed to citizens of Munich City, Germany in the spring of next year, courtesy of its city council. Nice. Lubuntu? I thought it's right. Lubuntu. Lubuntu is the LXDE version of Ubuntu. Uh, so it's kind of similar to the Windows layout. Feels a lot like Windows. I'll see if I can find a screen screen grab for you at some point, but it's it's cool. So, uh, Lubuntu nice. Disk will be made available <coughs> as a replacement for Windows XP, Microsoft's 11-year-old operating system, for which support officially ends in April of next year. It's estimated that some 20 million German PC users are still running in Windows XP. And rather than see all those PCs end up as e-waste, City Council decide to breathe new life into the old systems, complete with education and help with the migration to Linux. That's cool. The cost to the city will be somewhere near 4,000 euros from the printing of the disk to literature and promotions with local businesses. Munich is no stranger to alternative IT thinking, having transitioned around 13,000 of its government PCs to Linux around 10 years ago. So maybe you'll get more people watching your show. How on earth do we use this new stuff? Is that how it works? How on earth how do we work? use Lubuntu? I don't know. Let's go check it in with Robbie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And we also have... That's awesome, though. No, I'm excited about that because then we've got actual government organizations saying, hey, don't upgrade to Windows 8. Don't grab Windows 7. Here, have this for free. That's a really exciting thing. And when people realize that, hey, I don't have to necessarily replace my computer. I don't have to e-waste it or have it rot away in a landfill for 10 billion gazillion years can finally Why bring it back to life. Why would you throw it away if you could just upgrade? That's what, th I think that's the point though, is that Microsoft is that, because XP is done, right? Yeah, so but couldn't you just upgrade? To Windows 8? Yeah. Windows 7? No, not on an XP machine. Mm. That's the thing, is that they won't support it, right? So you, you have to either get a new machine or find an alternative, and the government is saying, here's an alternative, it's Lubuntu. It will work on your old hardware, because Lubuntu LXDE is going to work really, really well on even an old, old, old computer, because it's really lightweight. So breathe new life into your old machine. There you go. Ooh. A la Munich. What else you got for us? Um, let me see. Hmm. For all you Facebook users out there, personal details of about 6 million people have been inadvertently exposed by a bug in Facebook's data archive. Yikes. The bug meant email and telephone numbers were accidentally shared with people who would not otherwise have access to the information. Um, an investigation into the bug showed that contact details for about 6 million people were inadvertently shared. Despite this, Facebook played down the significance of the exploit and said the practical impact had been small because information was most likely to have been shared with people who already knew the affected Oh, give me a break. Come on. Yeah, so if you had any like creepy stalkers after you, they now oh, well, know where you are. We met at the pub one night, so it's okay for them to have my home phone number and address and email. And Sure, Facebook, come on. <laughs> yeah, they're just trying to downplay it so people Absolutely. don't freak out. 
That's and the they're thing. just but quick w- to say, oh, we fixed it, it's fine, nothing happened to six million people's information. But it's out there. And if I'm not mistaken, that quote most likely is kind of the impression, it, it most likely was people that knew them. Yeah, that's the quote. I mean, Rob, alone this week you've had, what, 10 million phone calls? 10 All his million. Fans. <laughs> from only six million exploits. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Facebook. All right, so what do we do? Okay, our Facebook privacy is compromised again. Facebook downplays it and says, oh, it's no big deal. The person probably knew you anyway. <laughs> but you just Whatever. said the prison probably knew you. No, the you. person. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> That's the attitude that they have. I don't know if I can trust that. Well, not it's not the first that. or the last time, yeah. so... True enough. True enough. Just watch what you put on there, I guess. What? What'd you do? Oh. oh it's still there. All right. Okay. Good. So, from the super <laughs> creepy files, oh. a charity is advising users that their webcams should be covered when not in use because hackers could be using them to spy on people. Ooh. Childnet International says webcams should be disconnected when not in use and teenagers should not leave webcams in bedrooms or other private areas. A BBC yeah. Radio 5 live investigation found sites where hackers exchange pictures and videos of people captured on their own webcams without their knowledge. Yikes. And um, there was a 20-year-old female student from Glasgow who had been who has a part-time job in a computer shop and she believes she was the victim of webcam hacking. Uh, she said she spotted the camera on her laptop, had turned itself on while she was watching a DVD in the bath. So a police Yikes. spokeswoman said webcam hackers would be prosecuted. If they could ever be caught. But yeah, that's scary stuff. You know, the little, I don't know, look at your laptop. If the you're sitting on the laptop right now. The little light at the top. See that little thing at the top there? That's a camera looking straight at you as you look at the thing. And that's a really scary thought that she's sitting in a bathtub. I hope it was a bubble bath. <laughs> but seriously, that's frightening. Fortunately, they were smart, and a lot of your, your laptops and stuff, bring up, your, bring up your webcam software and see if it happens. The light turns on so that you know that the webcam is turned on. Even your, your actual physical webcams a lot of times have a built-in light so that you know that it turned on. That's I just put on one of those little, those little circle <laughs> stickers. Yeah. If you some, never use it, just face. plop a sticker on it. Yeah, I suppose you could. But that, I don't know. There are advantages to having access to your webcam. Like no, if somebody you can stole just, your you laptop. You can just peel it off if you want to use it for right, something. Right, but if someone stole your laptop and the webcam was covered, you wouldn't be able to see who they are. It'd be nice if someone stole your laptop that you could be, you'd be able to do what the hackers are doing, and that is to look at the camera. Well, for the most, <clears throat> the majority of people wouldn't catch anything very exciting. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, okay, just be like, here's the laptop. Do, 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 do. But could it, could it be done with, I don't think it could with like a mobile device or something, but these things have cameras too, and they do not have a light. I suppose somebody could program an app to use the, ca- the web, like the camera, and you'd be unsuspectingly using your phone and set your phone on the charger and be doing whatever else. <laughs> In front of yeah. your phone. Yeah, well, the laptop <laughs> is scarier though, because it, you usually have it pointed at yourself, because like, like you say, you're watching DVD. Watching a Category 5 TV in your underwear. <laughs> Never good practice. <laughs> Never good practice. Uh, I think, though, that she must have had a disgruntled boyfriend who installed some kind of tracking software or something. Somebody had to put something on that how laptop. How would they know she was in the bath at that moment and they were turning it on? She probably is one of the on Facebook. Facebook. I'm going, I'm going in to my have a bath. bath. Yeah, I mean, why do people do this, right? I'm going to get a, have a bath, and then you know, ex boyfriend who installed this software on her laptop decides, hey, here's an opportunity to turn on the webcam. That sounds most likely to me because it seems like a if somebody has to install something into your computer, but it happens. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can accidentally install Trojans and things in your computer, but the, it really again tells you you need to have up to date antivirus on a windows machine another thing you got to watch out for that i've seen before is people install these programs that memorize all the keys keystrokes keystrokes so you yeah. go into on someone's computer you don't really 
know that well or something, you just borrow mm -hmm. it and go into your email or do banking or anything, they can go back and it says everything that's been typed right. by you. So Credit they'll know all your passwords, yeah. everything. I've seen that on computers before. That's why you got to be careful when you're using like an internet terminal at a public cafe. You don't know what they're doing there or if somebody's installed a key logger or something like that. You can actually buy devices too, USB devices that plug into your computer and then you plug the keyboard into that. So then everything that is typed on the keyboard actually gets stored on a microchip on that device so then somebody puts that in a library computer somebody comes in and uses it to do their online banking because it's free and then they come back a couple days later and they unplug it plug the keyboard back in and they've got all your your stuff right there that's kind of scary too lots of different ways that you could be exploited we're just here to scare you <laughs> and to make you wiser so that you know what to watch out for mm -hmm. <laughs> alrighty so if you want the full stories you can I go do. to category 5tv slash newsroom and the category 5 TV newsroom is researched by Roy W. Nash with contributions by our community of viewers. If you have a news story you think is worthy of on-air mention, email newsroom at category5.tv. For the Category 5 TV newsroom, I'm Rachel Shu. Thanks, Rachel. Tonight's show is brought to you in part by Netflix. Cat5.tv slash Netflix will get you a free one-month trial of the service. You can run it on your Wii. You can run it on your device, on your PS3, whatever you're using. You can actually watch the shows right there on your devices, on your computer, on your tablet, whatever. It, it, it will work for you. It's fantastic. Get it for free for a month. Cat5.tv slash Netflix. Also, tonight. <coughs> Did that hurt your ears? Sorry. Hurt mine. <laughs> Category 5 Technology TV is brought to you in part by NetTalk Duo Wi-Fi. It's the best we could do, Nelson. <laughs> Enough. No, seriously, check this thing out. If you haven't got one yet, you got to go out and grab one. These things are fantastic. It will fit in your bag. So, you know, if you're going to be going to a hotel anywhere in the world, okay? So you activate this in Canada, activate it in the U.S., and then take it with you everywhere. Here, okay, so I activate this here in Barrie, right? So Barrie, Ontario, Canada, here we are. Activate one of these NetTalk Duo Wi-Fi's. And now, pack that away, go to Europe, go to wherever I want to go, anywhere in the world. And as long as I've got a high-speed internet connection at the hotel, wherever I am, I now have my Barry phone right there with me. Huh? So I'm actually able to call you here in Barry as a local call. Mm -hmm. You can call me, even though I'm in China, and it's a local call. So next time you're traveling, take a NetTalk Duo Wi-Fi with you, mm -hmm. and you will have your local home phone number and all those facebook people can now call you as and well they can on your call holidays. you anywhere <laughs> in the world fantastic great for when the kids go away to school because it's free phone call in for mom and dad to be able to touch base with the kids and see what's going on and how they're doing listen in on the parties but this device i mean if you pay it's it's kind of like if you give me 60 bucks okay <laughs> give me 60 bucks but here's the catch i'm going to give you 700 dollars a year forever good deal right mm -hmm. so you buy the device you know it starts at 45 bucks but i would probably get the the higher end unit you know it runs about 60 70 dollars kind of idea and then for all time if, as long as you renew it you never have to pay a phone bill again the cost of two cups of coffee per per month oh i thought you went in general per like, month. where are you getting your coffee two at cups of coffee bucks. per month <laughs> Who doesn't drink that much coffee? And you've got your phone service, unlimited calling, Canada, the U.S., anytime, and it's free. No long-distance calls. Gotta love it. That's NetTalk from cat5.tv slash phone. Check them out. Go and grab one of those devices, and then you can call the studio here. Tell us how much you love the show, and it will be a local call for you. How much do you love that? All right, this is Category 5 Technology TV. I'm your host, Robbie Ferguson. Thanks for joining us tonight. Rachel. All right, so we have some of your questions now, and this yes. one is from Mastermind ZH. Mastermind ZH, what's up? Um, he says, hi, Robbie, short time fan here. I'd just like to say you're great, and the entire show is just awesome. I even like the episodes where you do something technical, even though I know most of it. Show Isn't off. Isn't that every episode you do something technical? <laughs> um, you're also an amazing singer. Oh, dear. Hello. 
much did you pay this guy? <laughs> <laughs> I really got to stop sending email to myself. <laughs> um, I'm blushing. And that is kind of what this question is about. Okay. So I know you have a YouTube channel where you sing. So would it be yes. all right if I downloaded some of those songs for private and maybe some community use? Or is there some other way to support buy your music i'd also hmm. like to ask you if eric kid has any medium he sells his music through because i really like his music as well cool um yeah and please forward this email to eric because i think I he's just awesome that's so nice that's literally in the email yeah and probably said just like she said it uh that's very kind thank you uh yeah eric and i both have music out there eric has recorded some stuff in the show but i've got big news something that's in the works you're gonna love this mastermind here's the thing eric kidd is currently in the process of putting together a concert that is going to be broadcast right here on category 5 tv live so make sure you watch for that announcement this is not the official announcement but what we're doing is we're actually setting up a, a full evening concert you'll be able to tune in live you'll be able to donate and you will receive a copy of the music uh, in mp3 format so uh, he will also have cds for sale all that kind of stuff so that's something exciting that's in the works that is really not really related to the technological end of the show but it's a way that we're you know giving back to our volunteers by supporting eric kid we love him and he's he's uh, been a great uh, asset to the team so you know we want to do that for him and for you the viewers who are fans of eric kid uh, for my music go ahead and, and download it all you want um, and actually uh, i'll post some links in the show notes for episode 301 if you want to download the cd for free as well or you can donate if you like to and that money will go toward the show so thanks for the email cheers all righty we have another one here from steve hey steve he says i think that a tablet can also be a laptop and a desktop with a couple of usb ports type a standard and a hdmi yeah. port for the monitor or tv i use a 220 dollar 32 inch tv as a monitor for my laptop as my monitor uh via usb port why they don't have these ports on tablets is beyond me. Also, when mm. OLEDs come out, you could have a cylinder computer like a paper towel cardboard center on each end. Cool. You can have USB and HDMI ports. The OLED would wrap around the cylinder so the OLED screen would not be bent too much and break. It would be a gentle curve. You could wear the computer hanging off your belt. And uh, I noticed the new BlackBerry phone has a USB and HDMI port. Great idea. I wish they had used a standard size USB. The micro USB cord is hard to find, but you could hook your ah, yes. phone into your TV and keyboard, making it a full scale computer. Mm. Yeah, no, I mean, with Android and so on, it really is an OS. When you're used to these kind of devices, they're called, uh, you know, it's the one with that thing on the back. The one with the thing on the yeah. back. Yeah. You see that? that little icon right there that basically means we're not giving you anything that we can't sell you later however my acer tablet which i'm looking at right here rachel can see it i know you can't see it at home and i can't really pull it out to show you because it actually operates the theme music here at the show so i can trigger it like that that tablet has full you know it's usb full size usb it has also micro usb it has hdmi video output it has the works. I mean, it's all there, and it's a dockable, and you can get a keyboard for it, so it works just like a computer. And it's Android, and so it it does work quite well for that. So don't think that tablets don't already have that. It's just these devices with that little logo on the back. They don't because they want to upsell you in a couple of years, so that you can keep upgrading and upgrading and giving them your money. But when you get into uh, more open stuff, stuff that's based on Android and and uh, you know, my Acer tablet, like I say, it's already got all that stuff. So it's expandable. How many times have I plugged in? How nice is it that I can plug in a USB keyboard and do this on the Internet? Or plug in a USB flash drive and bring up my photos. Don't have to email them to my iPod. Right? Or sync them through iTunes. That's even worse. Or, you know, you get an Air Mouse like this and you plug it in. And now you're going like this on your tablet or a regular mouse, whatever you want. So, yeah, it's fantastic. And then plug it in with HDMI to your 52-inch TV. How do you like that? I wish. Mm. Or your, like, 30-inch TV. 
Mine's like a 27 inch CRT, so oh. don't feel too bad. <laughs> All right. So, hello, category five. Hello. I've seen your video on Wirecast how to set it up. I really okay. had many problems, and I hope that you can help me first. I can certainly try. I would tell you what my goal is and who I am. My name is Sebastian. Hey, Sebastian. And I'm from Denmark, and I'm 23 years old. 23 years old. I'm a photographer, cameraman in my spare time. I take the video to part celebrations. Um, there are many who have asked if I can send it live, and I cannot because I do not know how to. Okay. I'm fresh on new ideas and new technologies. I have agreed with the owner of the room. It is okay to put the camera up, and he gave the green light. So, my objective. I put three Microsoft Live Cam Studio webcams up to be activated when my laptop is with me and must be able to record live at parties. Okay. I have one piece 15 inch MacBook Pro, one piece access to DIN DNS Pro with 14 DAGs trial period. Okay, days um, maybe? Okay. Days maybe, day yeah. Trial. One PC Wirecast with 14 day trial period. To test if it works, I would use MacBook's webcam to start with. Okay. How to start and what DIN DNS is used for. My rival who has a website, www.photolive.dk, send from your laptop to the network, but he uses DIN DNS. I do not know why. Okay. I hope you would help me. Sebastian, I think I grasp what you're saying. Okay. If I follow the email correctly, and forgive me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like maybe like a club or some kind of party facility something they want to be able to film and broadcast live parties be it even a, a venue maybe that you know people can rent and come in and the party can be broadcast on the internet for people who uh, can't be there which is pretty cool and wirecast is great for that so if i if i may i'm just going to come up on on your screen here so that i can see Okay, so you've got a MacBook Pro. Cool. You're using three Microsoft, Microsoft LifeCam Studio cameras because you saw them used during my tutorial. The difference between you and I here, Sebastian, is that in my tutorial, I'm sitting in a studio under these great lights. I don't know if you can see them. See these things? So we've got these great big massive suns in our faces and that is why we're able to use webcams. In a party venue, you're most likely, people are going to get really upset with you if you put one of these in their face. And so a webcam is literally not going to give you the frame rate that you're going to need because what happens with a webcam uh, and, and the Microsoft LifeCam Cinema Studio, they're no exception, is that if you uh, don't have enough natural light or light provided by natural balance lights, these are 5500K, uh, 5, so... Um, if you don't have that, then it's going to bring down the frame rate to be able to bring up the brightness. So then all of a sudden people are moving like this in the video and it's horrible, not really usable for, for your scenario. What you need is you need to do something differently. Um, your MacBook, I'm not sure if it's going to be able to do it in this kind of environment. If it's fast enough, you didn't mention how old the MacBook is. You might be able to get uh, like a, if you've got Thunderbolt, you could get a, an external Blackmagic intensity uh, device which will allow you to plug in one HDMI camera and then you can get a hand camera like a camcorder that has HDMI output and that will be able to work in full frame rate 30 to 60 frames a second if you are streaming uh, in a dark room that's okay it will be able to compensate a lot better than a webcam will so that's my biggest concern um, is the camera so um, the DIN DNS thing, I don't think you need that. The reason that you would need that is if somebody is connecting to you. With Wirecast, you're going to be sending the stream out. You're going to be sending it to Ustream, or you're going to be sending it to uh, Justin.tv or YouTube. And when it gets there, that's where you send your viewers to watch it. Your, your rival, as you say, is using uh, a different technique. They're actually hosting a server on their system, and they're using D DIN DNS to allow people to connect to them and download the, the live feed from them. The problem with that is that you are very, very limited by the internet service that's provided at the venue. So if they've got like a high-speed internet connection, it's probably not fast enough to be able to host uh, a full event like that if you've got one, two, three, four viewers. So you tap into something external. You don't need DIN DNS, basically. So I hope that helps with your question. Um, feel free to email us more details, but I, I think your biggest thing is going to be the camera. 
those are probably not going to work very well in a dark environment. So, good luck. Wirecast is the right choice. It's going to work real well for you. Cat5.tv slash Wirecast. That's all the time we have. Mm-hmm. Rachel, <laughs> rock on. Yay, 301. Yes. <laughs> We made it through another one episode. Fantastic. 99 to go. I did it really quietly that time because it gave me a headache. (laughs) Oh, not to be nice to me this time. Yes, that's why. Alrighty. Well, nice to be back and say hi to you all. Have a good week. Have a fantastic week, everybody. We'll see you next Tuesday night. And uh, Eric Kidd is here. We're, we've got some exciting things planned for you. We're going to be talking more about the music as well. Rachel, great to see you. Thanks mm-hmm. for coming. Check out adzerk.com. Night, everybody. <laughs>